You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. It is time, once again, for TWIFO. This week in Futures Options, the program where we break down everything going on on the other side of the fence, the Futures Options side of the fence. Who knows what we're going to talk about? You got to tune in every week, hear the movers and shakers reports, even though we're getting requests <laughs> left, right, and center for some certain products. I got a feeling one category is definitely going to make it on the show today because it's moving and shaking as well. A lot to break down on the show today. Reminding you, of course, if you like what you hear, this show, anything else we do on the network throughout the week, keep rating and reviewing. It really does help the new folks discover the content out there. Of course, keep those questions coming too. Maybe you have a product category you want us to hit on. Maybe you're a huge fan of fluid milk. Who knows? We don't judge. Hit us up. Let us know what you want us to hear about. Or maybe you got some interesting questions. Got a bunch of those in the hopper today as well. Let's see who we're going to hear from on the old show today. First, let's go out to the, I'm assuming, very busy right now, FTSE Russell Studios, where we are joined once again by Mr. Sean Smith, the Managing Director of Derivatives Licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Mr. Smith, Welcome back to the program, and I'm sorry that you picked a boring day to come on the show, sir. <laughs> There's nothing boring about these markets. Um, very exciting, and it's great to be here. Thanks for having me again, Mark, and I am looking forward to a fantastic discussion today. Going to be a fun one today because we also have joining us, holding down the CME Group hot seat today, our old friend, Mr. Dan Granza, the president over there at Gramza Capital Management. Mr. Dan, welcome back to TWIFO, sir. It has been too long. 
Yes, it has, and it's great to be with you. And, Sean, I'm really looking forward to exploring some of these markets and what's happening right now uh, overall. It, it's an interesting time and an interesting day. What's the old Chinese blessing slash curse? May you live in interesting times. We're all living through them right now, so let's break them down. Let's kick it off with the Movers and Shakers report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, listeners, it's that time. Let's break it down. Let's see where the action has been over the course of the past week for everything that's trading over there at CME Group. And there's a lot of things trading over there. This week, actually, an interesting one seems to be biased in one direction or the other. Biased in the red this week. Looks like about two-thirds of the chart here lining up on the dark side of the list. Mr. Dan, you know what I'm going to ask you now, sir? Should we begin our journey to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, Or to the dark side, sir? I think we should start with the dark side. I knew I liked the cut of your jib, sir. All right. (laughs) Let's do it here (laughs) on the old show. A lot of red on the screen this week, listeners. Number five, we go out to the Nikkei off four and a half, almost 4.55%. It was number four in the other direction last week, up about two, a little over two, about 2.03% last week. Number four, the only index that can really hold a candle to the Russell 2000 out there from an equity perspective is the S&P mid-cap 400. Not one that we talk about a lot, but certainly moves a lot. These days off nearly 4.7% this week. Number three, it's silver back in the metals off 6.9%. Quite the drubbing in silver over the course of the past week. Again, these numbers are all since our last show last week, listeners. So a full calendar week, if you will, out there. Number two, it's the old E-mini Russell 2000 blowing the doors off to the dark side off nearly 7%, 6.97%. That usually be enough for number one in either direction, unless you factor in our number one to the dark side this week. Yeah, it's Bitcoin off 10.5% from our show last week. So a little bit of profit taking, perhaps. <laughs> I think the technical term is crypto getting annihilated out there. Today, big sell-off, a lot of red on the screen across the board in the crypto space. Let's go on out to the upside now. Number five, a name we don't get a chance to talk about that much here. That's oats, up about two and a third percent this week. Number four, soybean oil. Talk about them on the show not too long ago. I haven't often had a chance to break down the component parts, the meal, the oil, outside of the core soybeans. Where we got into some of them recently on the show. It's kind of interesting to see what's lighting it up out there. This week, number four, up three, almost three and a quarter percent for soybean oil. Number three, nat gas, up nearly four percent, 3.91 percent. It was number two in the other direction last week, off eight, almost nine percent, about eight and two thirds percent last week. So again, another week, another tumultuous volatile time for a nat gas number two lean hogs our old friend lean hogs breaking back into the movers and shakers up for almost four and a half percent this week about 4.48 percent it was number two exact same spot last week number two to the upside up nearly three percent last week 2.87 percent so a good couple of weeks for lean hogs and number one this thing is so volatile i wish I wish we had options to talk about this one. It's lumber again, listeners. Lumber has been moving all over the place. Back to the upside this week, up nearly 11%, 10.81%. So our two number ones, we got lumber to the upside up 10.8% and Bitcoin to the dark side number one up 10.5%. So a lot to parse. We got people asking for a lot of things. Before we get to that, let's get to our vol movers and shakers as well. Looking at the declining vol out here this week, number one in the declining vol is 30-day Brent vol off about 4.5%. So that's front month vol. So take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but still interesting stuff out there. Followed by the euro dollar 60-day contract off about a little over 4%, about 4.1%. And then WTI vol coming in about 4% this week as well. So a little bit of a vol hit out there in energy this week. To the advancing side, all of the upside vol is equities, in particular, Russell 2000. The number one vol advancer this week is the Russell 2000 30-day contract, up a little bit more than two, about 2.1% from last show. Russell 2000 60-day, getting a little bit longer term, up almost 1.5%. And then we got the NASDAQ kicking in there at number three, up 1.3%. So vol in the equity space 
is increasing and it is moving quite a bit out there. It's a hot and heavy day in the equities. So I think we got to start there. Let's hang our hat in the equities. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Equities hot and heavy, fast and furious out there today. We'd like to start the equities conversation talking about volatility, setting the table, if you will, from a vol perspective. And come into Showtime, how long have you been saying that RVX, a.k.a. the BIX of the Russell 2000, couldn't really get below 30? Well, it did ever so briefly. <laughs> now it's back up north of 30 again. Coming into the start of the show is at about 33 and a quarter. Puts it up nearly four points, three and three quarters points from our last show. Got a high intro just today, almost of 36, 35.87. So in the height of the sell-off, that vol got pretty juicy, I think is the technical term. VIX come into showtime just a tick north of 21, about 21.05. That puts it up ever so slightly from last week, about a quarter of a point, but in a similar ballpark to where it was on our last show at about 23 and a half. That was the high for today, at least. So big range out there in VIX land, as well as we're seeing vol moving and shaking across the equity complex today. VVIX, a.k.a. the vol of vol, actually coming in a little bit since our last show, which is interesting. It's about 107 and a half to kick off the show. That puts it down about five points. And vol Q, a.k.a. the add the money vol, the NASDAQ 100. This one's surprising to me because NASDAQ, if you've been watching it, has been moving Quite a bit. It's in our vol advancers this week as well. So it has been moving quite a bit. And yet for the second week in a row, the vol Q is effectively unched. It was at about a 26 and a quarter coming into showtime. It actually puts it down about a quarter of a point, but it's pretty much from a vol perspective, pretty much unched from where it was last week. And the week before it was unched too. So it's two weeks in a row now. We've had vol Q effectively unched, even though NASDAQ is moving, which is kind of weird. So that puts that VIX to RBX spread, aka the small cap to large cap vol spread. A little bit north of 11, about 11.2. That's the widest we've seen it in quite some time. That's about a point wider than last week. So that shows small cap vol is getting frothy again. And the VIX to vol Q, so the S&P 500 to the NASDAQ vol spread, a little bit more than five points, about five and a quarter points. That's over two points wider than last, 2.1 points actually. So that's the fact that vol Q is kind of staying anchored and VIX is flopping all over the place. Makes that spread kind of interesting as well. That's the widest we've seen that in quite some time as well. So a lot going off. Sean, we got to start with you. Small caps are just moving and shaking. We had one of our hosts on our last show say effectively right now that RBX and, you know, just small caps in general. So you're talking IWM, you're talking, talking all the different flavors of small cap are effectively the tail that is wagging the dog of the market right now. That's how much movement is going on out there, Sean. So a lot popping off in small caps what is lighting up your tape today and this week, sir? Um, it's really interesting to see uh, this Russell movement. Of course, you and I have spoken about volatility in the um, in the Russell 2000 in the U.S. small cap index um, over the last several months, how it stayed bid through the rally, um, mostly because of upside call buying, giving um, uh, volatility that uh, that boost. But as we said, the skew j just never cut. So there's always been this this need for protection along with opportunity to the upside in in, in Russell two options. Um, but as we've always talked about, uh, the Russell two thousand small cap index is 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 a domestic index of U.S. companies. And I think what it kind of escalated this this slide is the 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 recent durable goods number um, which came out. Um, which was a well, first drop in several months, right? Uh, in many months, actually, um, which showed that uh, uh, small caps, um, U.S. companies, um, durable good, I'm sorry, uh, orders for durable goods fell, what, 1.1%, 1.1% in February. And, you know, these products are electronic appliances, machines, cars, other kinds of transportation uh, equipment, all uh, smaller U.S. companies that are uh, are have been affected, and you, you know there's been uh, a, a talk of inflation. There's been a talk of interest rates rising. Those raise costs and concerns for our our our, our smaller U.S. domestic companies. Um, and uh, that we're seeing this volatility, and we're seeing this movement in the index. We're still way north of 2,000 in the in the Russell 2,000 index. Um, as you and I uh, continue to talk about. So the performance is fantastic. Um, but as we've we've always said uh, on the derivative side, 
our, our exchanges have been seeing record volumes, but uh, they are uh, performing at, tremendously uh, during this 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 move. Um, traders are, are getting their their uh, hedges off. Traders are getting their uh, risk risk uh, 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 positions on and off. There's an opportunity to harvest volatility for those that uh, are endearing a harvest volatility trade. Um, but uh, as we've always said, the the, the market is going to move. There's going to be uh, uh, news that moves it in both directions. Russell performs to the upside, outperforms to the upside in a good, strong U.S. economy side when there's uh, uh, some concerns in regards to that growth continuing. So he, here we are with uh, uh, the market taking some some breathing and uh, volatility is up. Uh, but uh, it's it's great to see that uh, uh, our our investor community has the ability to uh, put trades on and off in our derivatives uh, exchange partners, Cebo Global and CME Group, uh, in, in having a good experience doing that. So interesting times. And I'm sure Dan Grams has got a, a lot to talk about here as well. Dan's champing at the bit. I could see him over there now. Obviously, Dan, a lot popping off in the equity space. we got to start with small caps because it has just been, like I said, one of our cohorts said on our last show, the, pretty much the tail wagging the dog. The movements we're seeing out of small caps, of course, on the way up have been just insane. And now to the downside again, just extreme outperformance in both directions. So I'm sure it's kind of hard for it not to be on your radar right now. So what's been lighting up your tape these days, Dan, from a small cap and indeed from an equities and volatility perspective? Well, I think from the small cap, uh, Sean, I really like your observations. And what's interesting about this sector or this part of the marketplace is how sensitive it is. You know, is it is it a market that leads the other markets? And we've seen that in the past, where these smaller to mid cap companies are more agile. And I have to tell you, I, I think the action that we're seeing here right now makes sense. But I'm not looking for further movement down. Let, let's talk about why I think it makes sense first, I guess. And that is what's been happening over the last few days in equities in general. Had we had absolutely horrific fundamental news? Not really. We've seen some softness, but overall, we're still okay, I think, fundamentally. We've had the Fed come out and make their comments that they think the economy is strong. They're planning on holding the course steady. Uh, there's no dramatic changes expected in interest rates. They're going to keep accommodating the market by their bond purchases. So I think the Fed is doing what the Fed should do. Inflation is still low. They said, well, there's a possibility of inflation this year, but we're not planning on really doing anything to change that. We expect a little spike that's possible towards the end of the year. I think, I think that takes some of the fear out of the market with regard to that. And let's talk about Yellen. First, we know that Yellen and Powell should dance together fairly well since they know each other well and they worked together in the past. The thing that Yellen has said is how do we pay for stuff? And we may need to increase taxes. Now, there's a few words here I think that's important. May. Now, is it expected to happen? I think so. But what does the market say? Holy Toledo, they're going to increase taxes. And what does that do? That means it's going to cut down available money to be invested in stocks. It's going to have an impact on earnings and the stock market goes down. So has the mid caps been going down and these other indices going down because of a horrific fundamental shift in the market? I don't think so. I think they've been moving down because of a word concern. And personally, when I see the word concern, anticipated, uh, possible, when I see those words in the news stories that come out, I expect two things. One, I expect volatility, and it's usually negative uh, because it's an ominous forward thinking. The second thing is I don't expect it to last. So do I expect volatility? Sure. Are we seeing volatility right now? Absolutely. Do I think we're at the beginning of a dramatic downward change? No. 
I, I don't think so at all. If you, if you and I go back and explore the times where we heard concern and we see volatility in the market, have we seen a permanent trend change? And I, I can't think of a time where that's happened. And maybe somebody can correct me on that. Uh, so I don't expect a sustained move to the downside. I don't think the fundamentals support that. So I, I am looking for a market, you know, maybe we're going to hit 2250 in the Russell uh, and, and bounce off of it. I think what's going to be important, like today's action, for example, yesterday we fell out of bed. Today's action in the Russell and some of these other indices, which are actually more aggressive, but in the Russell, we're stopping to catch our breath. We sprinted yesterday. So today we see that smaller range right on target. To me, the key for us to pay attention to is Friday. Do the people who have sold this market for the last couple of days, do they want to go home short over a weekend when we have a situation that's really not that ominous? I, I kind of don't think so. So what I think would be encouraging are two things. One, Tomorrow, maybe we do go a little bit lower, but it's how we finish. And if we finish with the market bouncing off of those lows, then I'm looking for an update on Monday. The second thing we'd want to see to reinforce that is Sunday night, 5 o'clock Chicago time, when the futures begin to trade again. So if we see that stronger bounce on Friday, does it carry over to Asia? That's the next clue I think that you and I have. And if Asia opens and starts to move up, that could be the low of Monday session. So Asia sets the tone. Europe may or may not reinforce it. And we need the U.S. session to carry it forward. So that's kind of how I see that happening. I think in the Russell, it could go back to that leadership phase that we typically see in that indice. I think it's really critical that people pay attention to it. Uh, we're seeing the Dow and the S&P bouncy. When we think about volatility, it's increased. But look at how it's behaving. I mean, the S&P was falling out of bed. The Dow was falling out of bed today. But look where they are now. They're back towards their highs. So we're seeing them come off of their lows, and we're also towards a, the afternoon session. So I think we're seeing some positive setup for Friday's action. Just one more thought. In the Dow, if we don't get above 33.8 or 32,800, 32,800 by Tuesday of next week, then I look for, or Wednesday at the latest, I look for a sideways move to begin there. So I'm not bearish on these markets. I look for positive closes on Friday, and I'm looking for follow through to the upside next week. I think that's a good point about the going into the weekend. You know, weekend risk is a very literal thing right now. It's been demonstrated many times over the course of the past year. And we've said many times over 2020, now in 2021, maybe keep your powder dry a little bit. Maybe close out some stuff going into the weekends. You don't want to have extreme risk sitting out there in times when you can't close it out. I thought, so I think Dan's point about some folks who are maybe heavily shortened right now, maybe closing out, keeping their powder dry going into the weekend probably has some legs to it let's see what there's legs out there in the russell 2000 options trading over there at cme you guys know how to get the reports in your hot little hands completely for free cmegroup.com slash twifo twifo or slash twio twio both those links should work keep them lowercase for some reason caps tends to throw a monkey into the works i'm not sure why but for whatever reason keep them lowercase you get access to all this goodness go into the equities drop down pull down russell 2000 you'll see what's lighting it up for yourselves another pretty active day almost twenty five thousand contracts on the tape already that's pretty hot and heavy for this time of the week let's see what's going on out there 38 percent you know the equities love near dated contracts and that's pretty much the case again almost 40 percent 38 and a half percent of the paper going up in the week four march contract that has a whopping one day to go <laughs> listeners <laughs> kind of hard to parse that from a skew perspective let's try to go a little bit farther out i guess we'll go out here to the april contract and get a little bit of 
the fun going on out there. The April contract has about 14.3% of the paper. That also has a little bit more time to go, about 22 days. And by the way, if you're wondering the vol on that front contract that's going away tomorrow, I use vol in air quotes, 42.3, up 14, nearly 15 handles. The vol out in a little bit more staid contract like April, 32 and about a half, up 54 points on the week out here let's go out to the skew now go out to april you can't really analyze skew with one day to go it's it's a meaningless measure at that point uh 13.6 percent bid were the puts last week this week 17 and a half percent bid not really surprising we're seeing dramatic outperformance to the downside when things get aggressive in one direction you start to see the bids lining up if you move gently down the skew you should see the downside whatever direction you're moving in start to come in but if you move aggressively that's when things start to get a little bit more frothy. Uh, to the upside, let's see. The calls are about unch. That's kind of interesting. The calls were 11.2% cheap last week, this week 11.5%. So no material bid coming up on the calls as there sometimes is when you're blowing down uh, to the downside. Maybe you get a little bit of that aggressive rotating of the skew. In this case, not so much. Calls are unch. They're not hitting them either. They're staying unch. That's that's kind of interesting. And then but the puts are getting bid up. In terms of where the action is this week out here in small caps, it is that one day to go contract. 22.10 puts. By the way, listeners, we're at about almost 21.60 coming into the show at this point about 2158 or so just tick below it actually 21 5, 57, 90. so still well north of the 2000 level but it's the 2210 puts going out tomorrow that had the most action this week 3350 1300 of them going up today 2000 on tuesday almost all that opening so someone opening for size on the 2210 puts on Tuesday, I got a feeling that trade's looking all right <laughs> right now, listeners, unless he was drawing an aggressive line in the sand, in which case, maybe not so much. But I got a feeling this one's looking all right here, listeners. So someone's scooping a little bit of dark side and doing well, looks like this week here in small caps. We well, we'll get to a listener question about all things small caps in a little bit later if we have the time out there. But Mr. Sean, before we keep rolling, obviously things are hot and heavy out in your neck of the woods. Anything else you want to add before we move on out to our next product category, sir? No, it's it's just great to hear the feedback from Dan on these markets and, and his uh, his outlook. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting to see. Um, uh, again, volumes are just really strong on our partner exchanges, meaning you know clients are are, are able to to get those trades done. You know, volatility is is uh, is interesting um, as it as it's as it stayed has stayed bid, and uh, um, it obviously has been uh, bid for for a reason. Um, there's there's been strong activity in the uh, rut contract over at SIBO. There's been strong activity in the new mini Russell options at SIBO as well. And uh, you know, last week was roll week uh, for uh, the Russell futures over at CME Group, and uh, uh, we're now into that June contract. So, as you know, June's a a, a big big historic month for uh, Russell reconstitution. So we have that coming up, but uh, more more to talk about on that in coming shows. But um, um, I'm just really, really thankful to have Dan on the show to uh, uh, give his perspective on the equity markets and most in particularly small caps are dear to my heart. <laughs> All right. Yes, they are. All right. See me always puts out a little a little question before the show. They want to know what complexes do you folks want us to talk about on the show this week. And not only is Bitcoin lighting up number one to the dark side off 10 and a half percent, but you folks are hitting us up saying, talk about crypto, talk about Bitcoin, including folks like Gringo and Adrenaline Coin and a bunch of other ones out there. So I think without further ado, we got to make a pit stop in crypto. It's time to explore the volatile world of Bitcoin, Ether and more. It's time to talk about crypto. All right, everybody, you asked for it. We'll deliver it what we can out here coming into showtime this is just a drubbing we were talking about it on our last show the option block as well you know things are crazy by the way in the crypto space when even a guy like uncle mike on the last show who doesn't watch crypto at all has come out unabashedly against it doesn't like it was started off his, his analysis talking about all things crypto that's how much things are moving coming into showtime now we're seeing bitcoin at 52 175 that's off the lows of the day but still well off from our last show off 11 and a half percent nearly 7,000 handles in that front march future which has less than a day to go now since our last show a little bit farther out the 
You know, you're talking April future has about 52,400. That's what the price is out there. That's off 7,300 handles are about 12 and a quarter percent. So even worse, going a little bit farther out. Let's look really quickly. Unfortunately, it's still, I mean, the futures are hot and heavy. I'm sure if I pull up the futures volume right now, we'll see a lot of numbers going up on CME for whatever reason. And again, this is something I brought up with Tim McCourt, who heads up the cryptos over there. We haven't seen the options really yet following suit. That said, you can go check out the cryptos for yourself. They are the newest category to our TWIFO report. Go in there to the drop down and just choose cryptocurrencies. Ether futures are in there now too. Unfortunately, there's no options yet on Ether, but you can look at the Ether futures as well. But coming into showtime right now, we're seeing the vol out there actually coming off a bit, which is kind of interesting. That's been a narrative we mentioned on our crypto rundown program on Monday as well. Bitcoin vol since we started that show, has been north of 75 and well into the triple digits for most of the last year. And then this past week, it's come back to that 75 or so level again. Right now, it's at about a 76.84. That front month contract's at a 75.24. That's the lowest we've seen in quite some time. I think since actually since like Christmas Day. <laughs> it's the lowest vol we've seen in Bitcoin, certainly this year. Bitcoin has been off to the races. So yeah, about a 76.84 on that April contract right now, which is off nearly 13 points. So despite the fact that we're selling off pretty hard, you know, Bitcoin, everyone conflates equity volatility with how other products should move. They think a sell-off should equate to a ton of vol, but it's not always the case. And in this case right now, net on the week, we're seeing vol has come in quite a bit. In terms of the skew, again, read into this a little bit of a grain of salt, not a ton of options paper, 205 contracts on the tape right now this week. Now, that's a 5x multiplier, so you get a little bit more and you start adding in the multiplier, but still, not a ton of paper yet. The most active contract out here this week actually was the 73,500 calls out there in June doing a whopping 31. So it's kind of hard to analyze the skew out here. If you want really quickly, 55% of the paper did go up in this March contract that has, oh, one day to go, <laughs> not even. So it's hard to analyze the skew. It looks like puts their bid right now, which is kind of interesting. And also, if you know anything about Bitcoin, very different than it is normally out here in Bitcoin. Usually calls are predominantly bid all the time. But as we've been talking about crypto rundown too, and the open interest perspective, and just from an overall bid and skew perspective, Puts are starting to get neck and neck with calls these days, which, again, given today's activity, kind of hard to blame them. Dan, I'm sure folks have been blowing you up over there on your YouTube channel and everything else, asking you to talk about crypto, 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 just like they are here, us here on the show as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on all this extreme downside we're seeing in the space right now, Dan? Well, a, a few things on this one. It is an interesting market, uh, and it's it's gone through a bit of an evolution. But first, I just want to mention before I forget is when you mentioned that the puts are being bid, I, I think what we're seeing there is logical. If you look at people have said, you know, we're at 60,000, well, and we see it backing off. I think that kind of action on that side of it kind of makes sense because one, people weren't expecting it. You know, if you think about what was happening before this market started to break, well, we had Elon Musk, you know, putting out $1.2 billion into crypto. Whoa, what does that do? And they'll take crypto. You can buy uh, one of his cars with crypto. We see banks starting up their crypto trading desk that they had closed previously. That's a change. We see institutions that are, for example, credit cards are willing to accept crypto. So what are we seeing in the marketplace in general? We're seeing validity. We're seeing this market becoming acceptable. Now, what still amazes me, there's nothing behind it other than good intentions. So is it the same as the currency? Is it a commodity? Who really knows? Can you buy something with it? Yes, you can, which implies that it could be more like a currency. But there again, there is like in a currency, you don't have a government backing behind it. So it is this strange market in terms of what we see. I think the back off, the way it came off, kind of makes sense. The action that we're seeing today, as you mentioned, Mark, it, we're trading off our lows right now. I look for that to stick as we go into the close. The issue is kind of what we talked about before. I think Friday could be a tell for this market. 
Do we in in the references? I think in the June contract that we'd want to look at would be a close above fifty five thousand. We get a close above fifty five thousand on Friday. It would imply one of two things: people who are short want to take some profits, as you mentioned, Mark, or it's gotten low enough to find buyers coming back into this market. Now, if it's the first one, if it's people taking profits, that means on Monday we'll go sideways or lower typically. If, on the other hand, we've gotten low enough to find some buyers, then it goes back to that Sunday night, 5 o'clock Chicago time, where we should start seeing the footprints of buying coming into play. You know, when we have that a strong close on Friday, we want to remember Asia hasn't participated yet. So that's why the five o'clock opening Chicago time is so important. It's Asia's turn to participate. So do they? So I think we could be getting near a low here in Bitcoin. And I also think that the next two to three trading sessions will give us some answers. So if we were long options, if we were long calls, for example, not suggesting anyone does that. But from my point of view, if we were buying calls, then I want to get paid within the next two to five sessions. If I'm not, I'd give it the big adios and I'd stand aside. Because what are we looking for? We're looking for that kick and volatility again, and we're looking for a directional play. And if that doesn't come to be, well, then we have to be more patient. And from my point of view, I want to get paid for the trade. And if the trade doesn't produce within that period of time, I would just soon stand aside. So I think Bitcoin's an unusual market. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's taking away order flow from gold and it's changing. I don't think it is. The correlation between Bitcoin and gold, I just don't think is there. Maybe temporarily in some ways, but long term, do we see any consistency there? And I don't think we do. Well said. So you know, people get all up in arms when Powell said <laughs> effectively you know, last week that Bitcoin and crypto is effectively a speculative asset class. But you're right, Dan. There's, there's no, I like your way you put it. Nothing behind it besides good intentions. There's, there's no fundamental value to this. You're not getting a piece of a corporation or some sort of claim against their debt or anything like that. That's a, some sort of core building block of the value. It's literally what the next guy will pay for it. And right now it's a lot less. Uh, so it's fascinating to watch people get up in arms when you say stuff like that. But it's it's the truth when it comes to all things crypto for the most part. There are some assets that have a little bit of you know utility value to them. But outside of that, it is a fascinating space to watch completely out there as well. But you folks are also hitting us up about energy. A lot of movement out there as well. So we got to hang our hats out there next. Time to talk some energy. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, energy time. We got a lot popping off on the energy side of the space. We actually have nat gas in our movers and shakers. Number three to the upside, up nearly 4%. Number two in the other direction last week, off 8.66%. So interesting stuff. A foot out there. Of course, crude has been moving out here as well. Obviously, a lot going on in the energy space for a number of reasons. We're seeing new lockdowns over there in Europe. That's raising new questions about the demand side of the equation. Uh, of course, the tanker, <laughs> the tanker in the Suez Canal gave some midweek relief. Things shot up because we still have this tanker effectively blocking the Suez Canal. You know anything about shipping, listeners? That's that's a main thoroughfare. So if you can't get past this thing, there's a lot of goods and including a lot of energy that can't get shipped out to other markets out there. But that was a short-lived phenomenon. Obviously, the tanker is still there. At least it was as of showtime. Uh, so hopefully they'll get that. Well, not a tanker, but a cargo ship, I believe. So hopefully that'll get dislodged sometime soon. So they're not pricing in a lot of structurally more volatility or price action for this tanker going forward. It's the demand question that's raising a lot of specters out there right now. But we do have folks chiming in here about nat gas too. Let's go to... Uh, Dan, another Dan here on the show. Dan, 281-60850. <laughs> okay. That Dan wants to know, 
because we were talking about how LNG demand, nat gas is going sideways and LNG could spike on the Suez Canal jam. That's something we were talking about on the website earlier this week. He wrote in to say, why is that when demand is at a seasonal low and there's plenty of time to build for next year from a nat gas perspective? Well, let's, let's see. Let's see. What's going on out here in Nat Gas right now? First, we can get into crude a little bit later as well. Nat Gas uh, about two point five seven right now, actually up a little bit this week, up about a third of a point. And of course, since our last show, like I mentioned, it's it's been moving quite a bit. It's actually up almost four percent. So a good week here for Nat Gas once again. Short duration, easy for me to say. Contracts dominating the tape out here. 31.1% coming in a contract that goes away tomorrow. By the way, if you're wondering, 236,000 contracts on the tape out here in Nat Gas. So it's a pretty active product. So let's, let's move a little bit farther out. We've got a contract that's going away out here in April that has 27 days to go. Oh, sorry, May, May. That has 27 days to go. So that's a little bit easier to hang our hat in out here. Let's see, the vol right now at the money vol, almost a 31, 30.96, off nearly five points. So vol coming in pretty aggressively here this week, which is also kind of fascinating to see. We didn't see Nat Gas. We saw Brent on our vol decliners. I didn't see, and WTI didn't see Nat Gas. I guess it was, must have been right outside the top five, maybe, but it's still coming off quite a bit, over four and a half handles there in that contract. Skew wise, the puts last week, 2.1%. Bid this week, almost 4%, so almost doubling out there, which is kind of interesting. And the calls, 2.4% cheap last week. This week, about 6% rich. So the call is blowing up. That's not surprising. We've seen a decent move to the upside over the course of the past week. In terms of where the action is right now, we're at about a 2.57. Listen, it's the two half puts going out tomorrow, dominating the tape out here this week, doing nearly 18,000 contracts. That's far and away here. The big dog. Let's see how that broke down throughout the week. Really quickly, remember, you listeners, you folks can click on these links in the reports and see exactly how they broke down for yourselves. Nearly 18,000 of that, about 5,000 today. But the big day was actually Monday, about 7,000 going up, only slightly biased towards the opening. So a lot of back and forth on that two half strike. Again, not surprising. It's a strike that draws a lot of action when you're between the two and three levels, <laughs> hovering right around two and a half, vacillating around it. You don't see the two half puts have a lot of back and forth action. 2,400 on Tuesday, 3,600 on Wednesday. Like I said, about 5,000 today. So a pretty active contract overall. Then we fall off a little bit. Let's see what our next, our number two is out here. It looks like it's, it's the 240 puts also going out tomorrow. Had about 9,500 contracts. Actually, the big days today, 3,500 going up today, 2,300 on Monday, 2,000 on Tuesday. Followed hot on its heels by the two half puts going out in May. These have a little bit more time to go, obviously, about 33 days. And they did about 9,000 contracts almost exactly. So interesting stuff. We were talking about the three handle out there not too long ago. Now we're back down at around the two and a half level. Interesting stuff. Mr. Dan, I know you watch energy. You could probably spend a lot of time out here on all things energy. But interesting stuff. I know you have some thoughts on that gas and also WTI and maybe some thoughts on what's going on out there from a vol perspective as well, sir. Well, I, you know, I think on the volatility side for Nat Gas, some of the uh, numbers that you were providing us with kind of make sense. If we think about where is Nat Gas, as you pointed out, Mark, it is up. Uh, but if we think about where it's come from, it's been in a sideways move uh, really over the last few s- trading sessions, about a week and a half or so. So that's that's not surprising, I think, in terms of volatility plays that we're seeing. If we think about it in two ways, let's talk about the fundamental side of this market. Uh, we are seeing an increase in demand. Uh, we're seeing it in China. Uh, they're buying more of our nat gas, by the way. China, India, and a third country I can't think of, right? I think it might be South Korea, are buying some of our nat gas. Uh, and we want to remember, where is this being used fundamentally? Well, nat gas is something that's used to heat our homes and cook our food, which we think of. And we think about that seasonal aspect of heating our homes. But it's also used, about a third of it is used for that. And about a third is used to generate electricity. So that has an impact when we see that cooling demand and things like that. Also, 
if we think about the third area, and this is kind of where China comes in a little bit too as well here, about a third of it's used industrially. So steel production, chemical industries, we've seen those industries, especially chemical, actually expand as we've seen that gas prices uh, staying so cheap, and they are cheap right now. And then let's look at the supply issue. We have a tremendous amount of that gas in our country. We also have some challenges. Uh, if you look at the Bakken region in North Dakota, or if you look down in the Permian Basin in West Texas and East uh, New Mexico, uh, part of the issue we've had is just getting the nat gas from production, uh, from the production fields to where it can be start being used in other pipeline systems. Uh, the Bakken area, they've been flaring nat gas for quite a while. There's some changes coming about there to cut that back. Uh, so we have tremendous supply. Uh, I am bullish on it long term because I think our economy as well as the global economy is you know, throttled down because of this virus. And I think there's that potential energy, no pun intended, that's sitting out there to drive these prices of natural gas. So I do look for follow through to the upside in, in that gas. You know, when we think about crude oil, you mentioned that market. Um, it's kind of doing what it should. Uh, there's no reason for this to be at 68 or $69 a barrel, not fundamentally. We still have things throttled down in the economy. Our, our demand in the United States has come down about 10%, and we're seeing that in other countries as well. The transition, by the way, to electric vehicles is happening faster than anyone expected, which has an impact on this. And when we see low crude oil prices, it also has an impact on the U.S. dollar and vice versa. You know, if the U.S. dollar is weak, we have crude oil prices have a tendency to go up because crude oil is priced in U.S. dollars. And if I produce crude oil, I get paid in U.S. dollars. And when I go to take, go to turn my U.S. dollars into my currency, I get less of my currency. So if the U.S. dollar is stronger or weaker, it can have a, a bit of an impact on crude oil prices. I think right now, it's fairly priced. At $60 a barrel, there are people that are going to be profitable in the shale industry. So it allows some of those capped wells to be open, which also increases supply. I think it's somewhat of an acceptable level when you think about OPEC. They'd like to see it $70 or $80 a barrel, but we just don't have that supply demand situation, that dynamic to really drive prices higher. So my outlook for crude oil is a sideways move. I think right now for this trade in a 5 to $10 range for the rest of the year, I think would make sense. For nat gas, I do look for volatility, and I am looking for movement to the upside. You know, you mentioned that uh, the container ship that's blocking the Suez Canal. Just to give a perspective on that thing, because it is amazing. It was built in 2018. It's a quarter of a mile long, and it's 193 feet wide. You know, so it's 430 yards long. It's like the size of the entire state building floating out there. And the canal itself is a big deal, as you pointed out, Mark. Uh, you know, about 10 to 12 percent of our world trade goes through the Suez Canal. So if you look at Russia and Saudi Arabia, those are the top two exporters of oil uh, going into the Suez Canal. India and China are the biggest importers going through the canal. So what we're seeing now, it's about 4.4% of total oil that goes through the canal. So it's not the amount of oil that goes through that's going to have a global issue. That's one of the reasons why you see crude oil down a little bit today. But it is going to slow oil flow if you look at Asia and you look at Europe. That's where they're going to feel it uh, most rather than other parts of the world. So that and then how are they going to move it? it? It's tricky. And so what they're finding now, it may not be done in a couple of days and maybe a few weeks before that canal 
opens back up again. So it'll be interesting to monitor how the world does react to that clogging of that trade area. Fascinating stuff. Note also is fascinating, listeners, is your deluge of questions. You guys are hitting us up fast and furious. So we'll see how many we could squeeze in in our final minutes as we get on into your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, we got a bunch of people hitting us up. Let's get to it. Let's start with uh, Dustin. Dustin wants to know, are we still seeing five Delta calls trading in the Russell 2000? Well, we just broke down Russell 2000 options earlier, and the big trade was the 2210 put, so actually in the money puts now. But the answer to your question, Dustin, kind of the other end of the coin, the upside calls, is yes, we are still seeing a decent amount of paper going up over there. Like For example, I'm looking right now. You guys can see this for yourselves. Go into the TWIFO report. Go back to the equities, Russell 2000. I'm looking at the June contract here. 24 half calls lighting it up this week. We're seeing, of course, 2170 in the Russell 2000 right now. So those are pretty substantially out of the money. Not quite five delta, but they're starting to get into the ballpark of what you're talking about here, Dustin. We're also seeing 2380 calls going up and these are late May going up here. So, yeah, these have a little bit of time to go as well. But those also, again, not exactly five delta. That's the kind of the range that Matt was talking about. When he made that illusion, he's really just talking about small delta calls. It doesn't have to be specifically five. He was just talking about how small accounts are pouring into the upside in record levels. And we are still seeing a fair amount of that activity. Also seeing some contracts going out 22 days, more 2380. So 2380 is a, apparently a hot strike out here. So short answer to your question, Dustin, is yes, these small delta calls here in the Russell 2000 still going up. Sean, anything you want to add here for Dustin looking at the upside call action in Russell 2000? Uh, j- you know, just uh, some more of that observation. We have been seeing this upside call buying since mid Q4 of last year. Um, and it doesn't seem to be ending. Um, you know, there's still this this bullish this bullish sentiment of the U.S. economy roaring back with uh, um, COVID vaccines accelerating. Um, there being uh, incentives for U.S. companies. Yes, we had a, uh, a negative durable goods order uh, result this week uh, from the the government uh, statistics, um, which uh, has has made small caps breathe this week. The U.S. economy is is still looking like it's going to do extremely well. So uh, I'm not surprised at seeing this call buying at all. Um, but it's uh, it's really interesting to see. Next up, I think we got my vote, at least, for handle of the week. We got Pirate Trader. <laughs> he was commenting on our movers and shakers section. He wants to know, how do you get this, brother? I guess we got a little Hulk Hogan uh, action out there. How do you get this, brother? <laughs> he wants to know specifically about our movers and shakers report. Now, the TWIFO reports you guys can all get for free. That breaks down this weekend, gives you all the action we're talking about now. The hot trades, the skew, the volatility, all that stuff, and a whole bunch more. The movers and shakers report is a separate report that we generate there through, uh, the, through the Quick Strike tools. I do believe you need to be a paying subscriber to Quick Strike over there to get access to that. You can't click through it. They got to gate you on something, right? They're already giving you a ton of stuff for free. <laughs> they got to get paid over there at Quick Strike Land somehow. So if you want to get the Movers and Shakers report and generate it for yourselves, you got to have the premium version. Then go into the market scan section and they can do a whole bunch of things. The way we do that is just a very basic one week scan. So from our last show to this show, just nothing but underlying movement. That's all we're looking at there. It's just a futures movement. That's how we get our movers and shakers reports. You can parse it in other ways. We do that with the vol movers and shakers as well. So you can, you can parse it in a lot of different ways, but that's how you get 
the report. A lot of people ask about that all the time. That's a separate report. You can't get that on the Twifo link. All right, next up, Dan. This comes from Dan again. So Dan's listening live now. He wants to know. We were talking just about Nat Gas and everything over there. He says the expectation for spot price to fall over the next few weeks as well. He says listening live. So you haven't touched on the spot price of March contracts at less than two dollars and thirty cents versus April futures at just over two fifty. LNG and other exports are just over ten percent of production. So can they justify this huge swing in prices? Dan, I know you watch energy quite a bit. Have you had a chance to look at this very specific region of the Nat gas curve that he's talking about, the March 230 versus April 250 futures in Nat gas, Dan? You know, I have to tell you, I think it's a great observation. Thank you, Dan, for that question. Um, but what's also interesting is what you and and Sean were just talking about. What does that say to us about the the those delta calls that we were talking about in the Russell? It says something about forward thinking, and let's let and that's what the market does. If we look at the equity market, and I think the energy market does the same thing. So, you know, Dan, my feeling is it says something about expectations. What is that next contract that's out there that is so much higher at a premium? And, you know, what causes that difference? The difference between those contracts is what we refer to as the carrying charge for those contracts. Uh, that is what makes up that difference. And that's insurance and transportation, all kinds of factors that come into play when you look at those different delivery months. But I don't think it's unreasonable if you look at that expectation for the future. And it says to me that the expectation is potentially strong for that market. And that's one of the reasons why we see it in addition to that difference in carrying charges. Just goes to prove what I've always said. All folks named Dan are very knowledgeable sources on the market there, Dan. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, looking I'm at, not sure about that. <laughs> I'm looking at Nat Gas <laughs> here myself. It is fascinating stuff. If you want to look at more Dan with a whole bunch of letters or just a numbers behind your name, I do encourage you to check out the Twifo report there as well. It may help you to parse some of those nuances in between. I wish we had more time to get into it more, but we're kind of coming up against it here, listeners. Yeah, that music means we're kind of out of time here. So we can probably sink our teeth more into Nat Gas. You guys have questions about so many categories. It's only a one-hour show, listeners. Uh, we probably could do 100 just based on your feedback. Everybody wants something different. You want the ags. You want the metals. Of course, a lot of you want crypto. You want equities. You want energy. Maybe we need to make Twifle the three-hour extravaganza because there's enough going on out there. But if you have more questions, keep hitting us up. Check out the Twifle report in between. That'll help answer some of those questions. I'm sure Dan will be happy to answer all those. In fact, Dan, if other Dan or anybody else has questions about Nat Gas or any of these products you talked about here today and they want to hit you up for some more discussions, where should they go? What should they do? Oh, I'd be happy to explore those ideas with anyone if they find that helpful. Um well, you could go to dangramza.com, and it's a, a free website. I look at the market, 22 different markets every day, and uh, there's a free video there. And I pick out some different stock indexes, currencies, metals, energy, interest rates, ag markets. And uh, we take a look at what's happening with those. Um, so you could sign up for that if you're interested in that. And then uh, you could also get an email that's sent out to you uh, just when the video is available. And again, it's done uh, every day that we have uh, an open session. So I'm happy to explore any other questions that someone has. Uh, happy to do that as well. And also, Mark, I want to thank you for inviting me today. It's always a pleasure being with you. Sean, as always, great to be with you. And uh, it's nice being with everyone today. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, Dan. You guys have questions, hit him up. Check out his videos over there, dangramza.com as well. G-R-A-M-Z-A. That's how you find him. You can hit him up in between his appearances here on Twifo. A lot of stuff going on. He covers the whole universe of products. I'm not sure how he has time to squeeze it all in, but check it out over there for yourselves. And Mr. Sean, if folks are curious, and clearly they are about all things small cap, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Um, 
they should they should go to footsierussell.com and check out uh, all the small camp information that is at you at your disposal on our website they can also email me at sean.smith at lseg.com happy to answer any questions at your disposal um, but check out the website. There's so much information um, on our blogs. So it's footsierussell.com slash blogs. And there's webinars um, sharing information as well, all recorded, footsierussell.com slash webinars. And if you have any questions at all about any of the information, you know where to find me. So um, Mark and Dan, great being on the show with both of you today. Thanks again for having me. And Dan, I look forward to seeing you on the other side of all of this with vaccines in our arms. So I look forward to seeing you. There Sounds you, great. There you go. You know where to find them. FTSERussell.com, FTSERussell.com. Give them a follow on the old Twitters as well, at FTSERussell, all that data they're putting out in between episodes of the show. These days, a lot's going on in the land of small caps. You probably want to stay tuned to that. And, of course, you know where to go to get these reports and everything else they do over there, CME Group. Dot com slash twifo slash twio gets you to our reports you can get on out from there look at the educational section look at the research that blue and eric are doing over there you guys could spend hours over there see me group.com slash twifo though is where you should begin your journey on behalf of everybody over there at cme and sean everybody over there at footsie land and one of the many dans and indeed myself i <laughs> thank all of you out there for downloading streaming subscribing for listening live for sending in so many questions we only kind of scratch the surface of them keep them coming we love to hear from you and we'll see you back here tomorrow noon central 1 p.m eastern for volatility views then it all kicks off again on monday with the option block all the way through to thursday another episode of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEgroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.